Welcome. So tonight's class is meant to be, I mean, all of our classes are meant to be fun, of course. Um, but tonight we just want to talk about uh, kind of some of the back to basics about two of the most important Italian wine regions, especially for red, which uh, are Piedmont and Tuscany. So we're talking about the overarching region for each, um, and then the DOCs, DOCGs within them, and of course the IGTs, which is Piedmont and Tuscany itself, the larger general appellation of which allows for a much uh, broader use of different types of grape varieties and winemaking techniques, right? Um, so we've done in depth Piedmont classes before and separate in depth Tuscany classes before. And this will be a little bit more of an overarching, when you go to a wine shop or restaurant and you're looking for the perfect wine to enjoy, how do you choose between the two, right? And we just kind of look for ways to always make wine a bit more approachable um, and easier so that you don't have to sit with a list or walk into the wine shop and have to think, gosh, if I could only remember what Amber told me. And the point of this class is to make that, to simplify that. So it's easy for you when you walk into a place and you're looking for the difference between something like Rosso di Montalcino and Brunello di Montalcino, right? The difference between Barolo and Barbaresco. Um, not just in terms of, you know, maybe grape varieties or winemaking style, um, but also quality and price. Uh, you know, these, these red wines from Italy can range in, in price tremendously. So how do we understand by looking at what's, li, li, you know, what, what's written on the bottle, right? <laughs> Brunello or Rosso. By looking at what's written on the bottle, how do we have a little bit of sense of what the price of the wine should be, and then therefore the quality of the wine inside. And we always talk about the importance of Italian red wines and aging. If you do like, I always say, those uh, characteristics of more forest floor and mushroom or dried fruit, uh, kind of dried flowers, all of those components that come with wine as it ages, then you probably naturally enjoy Italian wines, especially reds, because the Italians have a history and a tradition of aging the wines at the winery where they develop those more tertiary or age characteristics to the wine, as opposed to places like France who actually tend to release their wines on the younger side, right? And it sort of becomes the responsibility of the consumer to age those wines until what might possibly be the peak time to drink them. So we have a couple of um, fun wines today that we've sent from Ledoux. Uh, you guys have probably caught on by now, but um, we are not able to ship wine ourselves anymore. So we've teamed up with a really fantastic wine shop in the city that we really believe in. They're called Ledoux Wines. They're located in the, uh, in the West Village um, and they really do fantastic things. We love partnering with them. So we've sent uh, two wines. If you decided that you wanted to open either of those up tonight, um, as always, we like to say too, how do you enjoy these wines later on tonight? If you're in New York, just get a great pizza from somewhere with either of these wines. You think about uh, Italian reds have the acidity to match up to the acidity of tomatoes, why a lot of Italian red wines naturally go so well with uh, tomato-based dishes or tomato-based sauces, right? Um, but they also have the tannin to break down the fat that we find in a lot of protein. So we think about, you know, uh, just sausage pizza, you could just grill a little bit of, or pan sear a flank steak would be really fantastic with this, kind of a white bean stew, just make some spaghetti if you're not ordering out or if you're not in New York City and you don't have that wealth of great pizza places at your fingertips, right? Uh, so Valdi Cava is a really important producer located in Tuscany. Uh, this is the Rosso di Montalcino. So we're going to talk a little bit about the kind of the differences in some of these areas, right? The Rosso di Montalcino versus the um, 
make sure I didn't mute myself there. All right, Rosso di Montalcino versus Brunello di Montalcino. Essentially, Rosso di Montalcino is baby Brunello. It comes from the same clone of Sangiovese. They come from the exact same area as Brunello di Montalcino comes from, but it's aged for a lesser period of time. So Rosso di Montalcino will be a younger, fresher style of wine. Um, in this case, these vines do come from the properties, um, younger grape vines here as well. So more suited to that uh, kind of earlier release, that fresher style of wine that you see here. It's an organic estate. They only grow Sangiovese. Um, Brunello di Montalcino and Rosso di Montalcino are for 100% Sangiovese only. You're not allowed to add any of the other grape varieties that you find in Tuscany and still call it Brunello or Rosso di Montalcino. But within the area, they do have other DOCs for other styles of wine. So um, they have one that's particularly for white wine that's called, now I'm forgetting, suddenly it's flipping my mind. It's uh, Moscadello di Montalcino, I think, for white wine. Sometimes they can be like dry to sweet. And then we also see Sant'Antimo, which is more for um, super Tuscan style wines that are using grape varieties that are not indigenous to Italy. So we think about a lot of the French grapes, which we'll talk about with super Tuscan, right? Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, uh, Merlot, Syrah, et cetera. So this is a traditional wine. It's aged in a large Slovenian boti. So oak that doesn't really add any uh, flavor itself to the wine, but does allow for that oxidation, that gentle aging. The second wine we have, 2016. This is the Giovanni Rosso. Both of these are great years. 2019, um, the, the year itself in Tuscany was, the weather was a bit erratic, but the quality was quite good. Um, in 2016, this is considered really one of the, the great vintages, probably for Barolo. It's not quite as ripe as we got in 2015. The tannin the acidity are going to be slightly more elevated. It really allows for wine that can, even though I think that this wine is great to drink now, especially if it has a little bit of air before you start to enjoy it. Um, this wine can certainly age here as well. Um, they used to say that you would only get two or three good vintages for Barolo a decade. Um, Barolo really is a region that's benefited and Nebbiolo has benefited from the warming climate within that particular region. So now the producers say, I think it was Aldo Vaca said something like, um, now every year it's good for Barolo, but you have your great vintages. So other than years like 2002, which was horribly rainy, or 2003, of which we know had a huge heat wave across all of the wine regions of Europe. But we like to say producer over vintage, right? So if you had great producers with older vines in Barolo in any of these areas in 2003, um, they probably were still able to make a really great quality wine. So David Rosso, the winemaker today, he really liked to make a copy of the terroir. This is the general Barolo wine. He's not putting a smaller cru or sorry on it. Traditional fermentation, 25 to 30 days. The traditional style of making Nebbiolo in Barolo, the more modern style sees extremely short macerations on the skin, sometimes only up to a week. Ages in large, it does age in French oak, but it's large neutral French oaks. So really even their, um, their entry-level Barolo ages for quite some time in wood before release. So what do you have with this? Braised meat, pasta with ragu. One of my favorite things um, I always talk about having with a Barolo is beef wellington. You have that beef wrapped in uh, mushroom or truffle and puff pastry. Anytime truffles come into season, which is right now, we should be thinking about Barolo. There really is a magic that happened with the Nebbiolo grape, which is so intensely aromatic. And one of those reasons is because it's very early ripening, or excuse me, very early bud budding and very late ripening. So it has an intensely long season. Uh, it to develop all of the aromas and flavor that it eventually has in the wine, right? So this is one of the reasons that Nebbiolo became difficult to grow. 
in even in places like Piedmont and Barolo, which led to some of that prestige. Um, but we are seeing with global warming in the area, those slightly earlier harvests before the rain comes in October is good for Piedmont because the ripe, the grapes really are ripe enough. You know, uh, there's a lot of disparate weather within this region, within Piedmont, especially in Barolo and Barbaresco. The biggest issues were spring frost and those rainy Octobers once the rain comes, making sure that your fruit is ripe before you pick it. Now, this is also one of the reasons that the Barolo of yore of history was so intensely tannic, right? One of the reasons was because oftentimes producers have to balance that concept of our grapes aren't quite ripe, as ripe as we want them to be, but if we don't pick, we might lose our fruit and we might lose this harvest. So you were probably picking on occasion grapes that were not as ripe as they could be because of that impending weather during October. So now that the grapes are ripening a little bit earlier because of the, the warmer climate, it's actually a bit better. So we'll take an overall look at Italy, right? We're talking about two regions, but we need to orient ourselves. Always have to understand where we are um, now, both of these areas, even though Piedmont doesn't touch the water itself, they're both influenced um, by the Mediterranean Sea, as you can see on this map. In Tuscany, there are coastal areas, the most important of which we'll talk about uh, a little bit is Bulgari, which is where we get the famed Sasakaya wine coming from. It actually has a DOC, Bulgari, Sasakaya on the coast, but Bulgari overall is an overarching DOC, is well known for its a uh, super Tuscan style of wine coming from international grape varieties. And when you look at a map and you think of the Tuscan coast and you compare it to a re region in France where you have Bordeaux grape varieties, you can see that we have a maritime climate that might mirror a little bit more of what we get in Bordeaux than somewhere further inland in Tuscany as well. Now we are further south, so we are certainly considering Climate-wise, this is warmer than what we see somewhere like France and somewhere like Bordeaux, right? Piedmont, we do have that ocean influence, the Mediterranean Sea, but we also have the influence of the Alps, right? The French, the Swiss Alps coming through this way, bringing a lot of that cool air, and we'll see it probably on the slideshow, I think. Um, Piedmont is Piedmont, Piemonte, it means foot of the mountain, foot of the hill. So we really are in the foothills of the Alps here. So we have a more continental climate in Piedmont. They are warm summers. Um, and this is one of the things to understand about Nebbiolo is that if you're blind tasting, Nebbiolo is a high alcohol wine. It is rare to see it under 13 and a half, I would even say 14%. So when you have a little bit of that warmth, that heat, if you're blind tasting a wine, it does because again, because of that long, long ripening season and because of those warmer summers, it does have a higher alcohol percentage typically. Can be one of the ways to sort of differentiate in blind tasting between Tuscany and uh, Piedmont, if you're thinking about Nebbiolo in Piedmont versus Sangiovese in Tuscany. Now, the culture and style of Italy, um, many of us are familiar with. Um, I, you know, Italy is a place, and I talk about this all the time, so many of you have heard this before, but, you know, it just bears repeating that I always say, like, if you love culture, you love food, you love history, you love art, um, <laughs> you love wine, Italy is the place for you, right? It really is a crossroad of of anthropology, of wine, of cuisine, of history, and really especially of art as well. Um, but the regions themselves are very disparate. And we talk about the Apennine Mountain, which is sort of like a spine that really runs down the center of Italy. And it made these kind of 20 different states that we saw in this previous slide um, really separate from one another. And it's not necessarily easy to travel from one area to another. And then we're not talking about these other regions of Italy today. It's easy to understand how some of the wine regions that became very popular, of course, the quality of the wine is great, but 
there may have been more opportunities for quality to improve because they were closer to ports. They were able to ship their wine and share it and sell it with other places in the world, bringing in more capital and making improvements in the winery. If you're somewhere like Puglia or Molise or even Abruzzo, even though I would say we see more wine from Abruzzo than Molise or Puglia, um, you have a lot further to go to take your wine to a port. So these areas tend to be um, you know, more intensely focused on selling the wine within the region themselves, right? We don't see as much of these wines exported. Um, so they also have these separate regions. The cultures are separate. The cuisine is separate in these different areas. We're thinking about pesto, right? We're really thinking about the coast of Italy. We're thinking about prosciutto and melon. In the Northeast, we have truffles and alba that we talked about. If you're thinking polenta, you're probably talking about somewhere like Emilia Romagna, which is where you see a lot of the corn in Italy grown. Strong pride in local heritage and culture. Um, actually, I listened to something really interesting today, um, and I didn't get a chance to finish it, but I was listening to um, a podcast on IDTT. I'll drink to that with Levy Dalton, and he's talking to Lorenzo Acamaso, who is also a very a staunchly traditional producer. And there was a part of the podcast where they started talking about um, in Italy, they've seen the sort of mass migration happen over decades out of the really traditional agricultural regions, and that includes wine regions, right? And a lot of this was actually happening prior to, we kind of think of almost as like the world wars being a little bit of a catalyst for that, but this migration was happening prior to World War I, World War II. So actually they say World War I and II actually kind of stuck some of that migration. But they say that something like 15 million Italians during this time migrated to other places in Europe and other places in the world. North America, South America were also quite common. And as I'm listening to this podcast, I'm just thinking about how strong the the Italian sense of being is in an Italian, even when you take them outside of Italy, you know, especially places here like like the Northeast, um, you know, people might be two, three times removed from Italy in terms of their, their heritage, their parents were born here, maybe their grandparents or their great, great grandparents who immigrated, right? But they still feel a really, really strong local sense of pride. And this is true in Italy too, where a lot of Italians are um, really, really proud of the local areas and regions that their families do come from as well. We know that Italians love food, they love wine, they love these things together. Um, the Etruscans, who are sort of the one of the first civilizations that we know of in the, the Tuscany, what would become the Tuscany era, uh, area, um, loved food and wine and throwing dinner parties. So they took a lot of their influence from the kind of the Southern Greek colony before they were absorbed into the Roman. So going back as far as pre-Roman times, <laughs> The Italians loved wine and food and partying and, and having those things together. Um, and you've heard me say it before, but in Italy, they say when somebody is drunk, not that they've had too much to drink, but they, they just have not had enough to eat yet. Um, so wine is food, it's part of the culture, and it does belong on the table. And nowhere in Italy do we see the premise of wine and food that grow together, go together so strongly. Um, and Italian wine often needs food. You know, there's a lot of wines around the world that you could just open up a bottle after dinner or maybe have a glass before you're going to dinner somewhere else. Italian reds especially are rarely one of them. They oftentimes really need food on the table to soften the, the palate of the wine because Italian wines, have very intense and very structured palette to them. So we're talking about Piedmont, we're talking about Tuscany and everything else will have to be saved for another class aside from what I already told you about. So we'll discuss the background, the history. We've already gone through some of that, but we'll talk about some of the major differences here. The background, of course, the geology, the climate, the terroir. Um, and the terroir and the, you know, let's talk about the soils and the climate will have a lot to do with how we classify and quantify the areas within Piedmont and within Tuscany. Like what does make 
Belange different from Roero and uh, Barbaresco different than Barolo, right? Or the different areas of Chianti different from one another. A lot of it has to do with soil and altitude. When in Italy, we're almost always talking about altitude, um, which is one of the ways that they really are able also to combat um, a lot of the global warming that taking effect in other countries within Europe. So a lot of these wines and these grapes are already planted at higher altitude that naturally mitigate some of the heat. We'll talk about Italian wine law, Rosa di Montalcino versus Brunello di Montalcino and everything in between above and below. We'll talk about the most important grape varieties. Um, both of these regions uh, are important in terms of both the traditional indigenous grapes, but also international grape varieties. And we'll talk about that within Piedmont. You don't see um, the, you don't oftentimes hear about the indig, or excuse me, the international grape varieties of Piedmont, um, but there are a lot of Barolo producers who make Riesling <laughs> or perhaps something like Chardonnay, especially for white grapes. Not all of the Barolo producers really love some of the indigenous white grapes in Piedmont and some of them do choose to use outside grape varieties. We're going to talk about uh, the most classic regions. We cannot talk about all of the regions in both, um, all of the DOCs and DOCGs in both, of which there are a lot, and we'll talk about the cuisine. So starting in Tuscany, um, you know, Tuscany is so fiercely important. I would bet um, for anybody on the call that had been to Italy, you probably have been to Florence, but it maybe is not as common that you've been to uh, the commune of Barolo or Alba or Asti or any of those smaller towns um, within Piedmont. It definitely is an area that would be more on the radar for somebody that's really into wine or into cuisine. Um, but Florence is really on everybody's list of a place to go for Italy. Um, you know, Tuscany, central Italy, we're in the heartland of Italy here, the region which formed uh, the Italian language, literature, art, the Renaissance happened here. The Chianti region was delimited and defined as early as 1716, right? Um, and so though it's not necessarily the political or the religious center of Italy, it really is one of the cultural centers of Italy. The region is, is rooted in tradition. Um, however, one of the things I, I really love, we'll talk a lot about traditionalist and modernist producers in both Tuscany and Piedmont today. Um, but most produ producers today, even though you know 30 years ago, there, there was kind of a war between these two different camps, most producers today fall somewhere in the middle. Uh, there's not a ton of Italian producers who make really, really modern styles, right? There's not a ton of producers who only who haven't upgraded their winery equipment and hygiene. Most producers fall somewhere in the middle. Um, it's an incredibly important place. They make a lot of wine within this region. A lot of DOC zones here as well, 52. There's more in Piedmont, we see a higher level of DOCG and DOC zones. We're going to talk about that wine law in a little bit. So don't worry if, if you're lost because of that. So we talked about the Etruscans, right? The ancient civilization, they were highly cultured. They took a lot of influence, as I mentioned, from the Southern Greek colony that had settled in Southern Italy, um, a huge love of food and wine and parties. Um, the Etruscans were sort of absorbed into the Roman culture as the Romans moved north. Uh, the Mesodria was really important, and you'll hear this still mentioned in Tuscany as well, which essentially was uh, the sharecroppers. And so what would happen was that most of the vineyard land in Tuscany, which is <clears throat> in general, let's leave vineyards out of it, let's say the agricultural land in Tuscany was owned by merchants who lived in Florence or Siena, it was owned by monasteries or nobility, right? Um, but they didn't want to necessarily work these lands. So essentially the Mesodria system meant that many of the peasants that lived in the countryside would be given the equipment and the capital 
and the land to work in exchange for half of whatever product came off of the land, right? So we would think, you know, wine, wheat, olives um, are all really important in this area. We like to say that in Tuscany, they still practice what we call sort of um, a promiscuous uh, agriculture where we have all of these undulating hills in Tuscany, right? Like coming down from the spine of these Apennine mountains and they are not all perfect for the same crop. So we see these patchworks of crops where they really tend to do best. So it's just kind of like quilt of, um, you know, olive groves and grapevines and different types of grapes, of course, which we'll talk about, and then also uh, wheat fields. So bread is a very, very important condiment. Sometimes it takes the place of silverware within Tuscany. The really classic style of bread, if you've been there or there's a um, a restaurant really close to me here in Fort Greene and they're a Tuscan Italian restaurant and they serve, I can't remember the name, um, I call it Ivini Iolio or something like that, but they serve the really classic Tuscan bread, which is unsalted. Like it really is like a vehicle for whatever comes on top of it. So that could be like salted butter and anchovies, right? We talk a lot about um, a lot of chicken liver mousse. They do a lot of white bean puree and soup within the area. You use it to mop up the extra sauce of whatever is on your plate. <laughs> I'm getting off topic. All right. You know, when I start talking a lot about food, I'm always thinking about what I'm going to be eating later. I'm the type of person who, once I've had breakfast, I'm thinking about what I'm going to be making or having for dinner. So just a little insight into my brain. Um, the fiasco is a really interesting part of Tuscan wine history. Uh, so fiascos initially were made for wines that are, were of higher quality. I think it was in the, um, you know, kind of the, the 16, 1700, they actually decreed that wines of inferior quality could only be sold out of barrel. So they tended to oxidize more quickly. These were really saved for the higher end wine. Um, but over time, after we started using a mold instead of using hand-blown glass, they sort of became to, they came to show the kind of kind of more inexpensive rustic nature of Italian wine in the 60s and the 70s especially. Um, so if you were a child of the 80s like me and you grew up maybe going with your parents to the bowling alley and you would see people drinking out of these fiascos, right? You can still go to places like Buca di Beppo and you see kind of big chain Italian restaurants and you'll see the fiascos everywhere, right? So today there are producers like E. Fabri is producing a wine that they're selling in a fiasco as, as sort of one of the um, kind of nod to the, the cultural history of Italy, right? So they sort of came to, um, you know, encapsulate the sort of cheaper rustic nature. We don't see a lot of these wines. It was actually Chianti Classico producers who began to bottle their wines in Bordeaux-shaped bottles. And that would be an indication during this time, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, before that became commonplace, that these were producers who were a little bit more serious about the wines that they were making, right? Lower yield, um, higher quality grapes, better clones, and so forth. In the 1960s, the Chianti zone is expanded. Um, the laws have been put into place in 1964 regarding what grape varieties you have to use to call your name Chianti, right? Or Brunello di Montalcino or um, Vino Nobile di Montalcino, all of these different things. And some producers didn't like the laws. They thought that the laws actually stimmied them and the quality of wine that they could produce. So they began making wines outside of the laws of the Appalachian of places like Chianti and eventually what, we, what was known as Chianti Classico. Well, because of this, they had to declassify the wines to just wine of Italy. They weren't allowed at this time in the 1960s, 70s and 80s to put any more specific area like, you know, I mean, they weren't in Barbaresco, but they couldn't use any more 
specific uh, indication of origin on their wine. So they were just wines of Tuscany. They were oftentimes using international grape varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, eventually Syrah, Merlot as well. Or sometimes they were super Tuscan that were 100% Sangiovese because at the time you had to, by law, include anywhere between 10 to 30% of the white grapes of Tuscany into your Chianti wine. And a lot of producers thought that this diluted the character and the style of the wine. So they produced super Tuscan wines out of 100% Sangiovese. And although that's the main grape of Tuscany, they still had to declassify their wines. Now, most super Tuscan producers who make um, 100% Sangiovese wines, even though they might be in Chianti Classico, even though the laws have been changed now since 2006 that you, in, uh, I think in the 1990s, they changed it. So you didn't have to include white wine. In 2006, they outlawed white grapes, sorry, not white wine. They outlawed white grapes in your red wine. Um, but today, a lot of the producers, although they could technically label their wines as Chianti Classico, they still choose to declassify them as uh, Tuscan, uh, like IGT Toscana. So this is an example of um, IGT Toscana wine. You can see that it says Toscana, Indicazione Geographica Tipica. This is Tenuta Sanguido, so it's the same producer of Sassacaya, coming from the coast, um, coming from the coastal area at the blend of Cabernet Sauvignon and Sangiovese. So declassifying the wine here. What else can I tell you? Um, in 1966, Vernaccia di San Gimignano became Italy's uh, first DOC. The system was created in 1964. And we're going to talk about Goria's Law and the IGT wines uh, when we talk a little bit more about the Italian wine law coming up here in a few slides. But just keep in mind that some the producers are suddenly declassifying these wines, but they're really expensive and they're exalted. And the press and the people absolutely love them. These wines like Sasakaya, these wines like uh, Ornelaya, Masetto, right? Um, who, who else do we have on the scene? We have the uh, Antonori, right? Making like Pignanello and things like these. Um, but they're not bringing any acclaim really to the Tuscan region. So in 1992, we created sort of a mid-step between the DOC or the DOCG and just the very basic wine of Italy category. So that created the IGT of which these boundaries were each one of each of those 20 states and allowed for more relaxed grape varieties and uh, more relaxed um, admittance or acceptance of different grape varieties and more relaxed rules of production. So just keep that in mind. So moving over to Piedmont, we'll take a quick look overall at this particular region. Uh, so we know that we're in the foothills of the Alps. Um, they have ranked six, so they have a little bit uh, less grape planted than what we see in Tuscany, but they have more DOC zones. They have the most, the highest number of all in Italy and 84% or more of all Piedmont wines are at the DOC, DOCG level. So you would probably say that this is the most quality oriented area that we do find within Tuscany, excuse me, within Italy. A little bit more so just because of the, the number of DOCs and DOCGs that they have, a little bit more so than Tuscany. So in 1431, we know that there was a law that declared that you could not up, uproot Nebbiolo. Um, if you did, it was punishable by death. You could also have your right hand dismembered as well, which tells us that they're really at this time understanding the importance um, and the quality of this particular grape variety, Nebbiolo. Single vineyard sites are becoming very, very important. We label them by something known as the, the MGA today, or we call them Sori. They can be oftentimes be compared to the crews of Burgundy, but it's really only been in the last, I mean, the MGA was, um, came into effect in 2010, actually. So I don't forget when we go to Chianti, Chianti Classico in 2001 also just authorized the use of 11 MGAs as well. So we're going to start seeing that in Tuscany too, but essentially it's 
it's um, classifying these individual vineyards and plots of land, much like we do within Burgundy. Um, and now this is much newer than it is in Burgundy though. So producer using these individual plots of land is, is not as common on the label. You certainly see some of the really large, or not large, but really uh, important areas or important story, like, uh, you know, Canubi or Chirequio, um, Brucia are all really important as well. So the geographical boundaries recognized in 1934 it wasn't until the 1960s that we really see a move towards a state bottling within Barolo. As I was mentioning before, many producers would own, it, it, the, the ownership of the vines in Barolo is very fragmented, much like you see in Burgundy as well. So it's very common for producers to have you know, a few rows of vines in one story and a few rows of vines in another. So it would, more popular commercially for the producers to actually blend all of these different story together and just sell the wine at Barolo. Um, it was more common be when the weather wasn't as good every year as it is now in Barolo, that rather than selling an individual, a single vineyard wine, they would produce a Reserva wine. So Reserva is a category that we're not seeing quite as much anymore. It's more common that you'll see the story or the individual crew on the label as the producer choose to bottle individual vineyards rather than kind of blend, blend, blend them all together, right? So Barolo and Barbaresco were both elevated to DOCG in 1980. Um, now, the modern techniques that came about during the Barolo Wars, the traditionalist Versus, versus the modern producers within the area um, really evolved the style. And traditionally, uh, Nebbiolo goes through an extremely long fermentation. Uh, we would say sometimes like 25 to up to 60 days fermentation, they would really let it go. The wines would age in really, really large, neutral, old Slovenian oak. Um, and this did create a wine that really needed time to soften within the bottle. Now, this is also prior to the 1980s, so we have to take into account that the climate at the time was different, probably creating harsher tannins. The, the grapes every year were probably not at their peak or optimal ripeness. And But in the 1980s, when we see the Barola war, Wars, the producers were thinking, well, there's producers and winemakers in other parts of the world that are doing shorter, faster, hot fermentation. They're aging their wines in Barik, small new oak that's adding flavors to the wine, but it's also, in, for Nebbiolo, new Barik kind of obscures the flavor of Nebbiolo, to be quite honest. But one thing that it does do is it creates more oxygen exposure in Barik and helps soften those tannins a little bit faster. So we have these two different camps of the styles. Now we're making more of a modern style, a more global style of wine with modern with modernist within Barolo, but is it a product of the culture, right? That developed since at least 1431, as we saw within the area. Skipping back to Tuscany, let's talk about the climate, the terroir. Um, a pretty dry maritime influence climate. Uh, summers are long and hot. The winters can be harsh in Tuscany as well. We talked about those rolling hills, so we see the variation in mesoclimate within the area. Montepulciano will be more seasonal and, um, and more continental in its climate. Towards the coast, we definitely see in Bulgaria and places like that a much more Mediterranean climate, which we kind of went over before already. We have two main soil types um, that we talk about primarily in Tuscany, although these are the only two. There's a huge variation in different soil types in Tuscany. Uh, the area is quite large, but we primarily talk about the Galestro and the Alborese, kind of more friable clay-based soils, and then uh, kind of a, a harder, firmer, kind of white limestone that we do see. We see the clay and galestro in Montalcino. And in Montepulciano, we find a little bit more sandstone and volcanic soils. Now, in Piedmont, we do have some of that maritime influence um, that we see coming up from the Ligurian Sea there, of course, just past the Ligurian coast, even though Piedmont 
uh, on the coast itself. They also have that cooling influence from the Alps and the Apennine Mountains. We have a rain shadow effect here. Uh, Nebbiolo, the main grape we'll talk about, it probably named for the fog within the area, which is, which is known as La Nebbia. This is one of the things that might really prolong that ripening for the Nebbiolo grape as well. In Piedmont, um, the altitude, the slope, the aspect matters. Uh, now, it, in somewhere like Barolo, Nebbiolo is not the only grape that is planted. It is the only grape that you can use in your wine to call it Barolo. But because of these different slopes and hillsides within Barolo or somewhere like Barbaresco, there are other grapes planted where Nebbiolo cannot reasonably or reliably ripen. So 20 years ago, all of the Nebbiolo in Barolo would have only been planted on south facing slopes. With global warming, we're seeing Nebbiolo being planted in places that might have been prior planted to something like uh, Dolcetto or Barbera, which are color, or maybe something like Palo Verga or Frasia. Now, all of these grapes can be grown in the area, in the DOCG of Barolo, and then be made into a wine and be classified as Longue varietal wine. So you would oftentimes see Longue Frasia, Longue uh, Bar uh, excuse me, Longue Bar uh, Barbera, what I was trying to say, Longue Dolcetto, right? The Tonoro River is really important. It divides the area, especially the region of the Longue and the Roero, which we'll talk about as well. And in Barolo, we the understanding the division of soil types is important because if we understand that the eastern side of Barolo um, has these older soils that create a much more tannic and structured grape and a much more tannic and structured wine, and that the Tortonian marl, the lighter, slightly more sandier soil of western Barolo creates wines of more relative elegance that are more aromatic, they can be really floral, and they have softer tannins and are oftentimes better for younger drinking than what we find on the eastern side of Barolo. And so the commune that we kind of see, so there's kind of five main, let's, let's go on in a, a moment. So it's kind of five main, um, five main communes in Barolo, there's 11 total, but the five main communes that we see, the ones on the western side are the lighter, less structured styles, right? More floral and aromatic. And that would include Lamora and Barolo. And then on the eastern side, the more tannic and intense style of wine, the ones you might want to age a little bit longer in your cellar once you get your hands on them would be Cast uh, Castiglione Faletto, Serlunga de Alba. Um, and, and I'm forgetting the last one, but we'll, we'll go back to it in a second. Italian wine law modeled after the French AOC system. DOCG is at the very top. Um, DOCG tells you that the wine is controlled and guaranteed. It should be the benchmark for the top quality of wine that you will find within Italy. Um, there are 75, 75, I should have looked at this information before class, sorry. If I don't look at this every time, then I'm like, is it 75 or is it 76? Because I didn't look right before class, but it's 75 or 76. I bet if Ben Cat's on here, he knows. And there's something like 400 DOCs. So this is why it's kind of hard to remember every single one of them, right? So DOCG controlled and guaranteed. DOC is one step down. Oftentimes DOC will also be for the younger release wine. So for example, Brunello di Montalcino is a DOCG, but Rosso di Montalcino is a DOC. So um, it can oftentimes be a stepping stone to the DOCG level. Now, we mentioned in 1992, we created the IGT or IGP category, which allows for more relaxed regulations regarding which grape variety you can use in your wine and the style of wine that you can produce. So usually lesser required aging in these areas as well. This allows for a lot more flexibility for the producers themselves. Vino de Tavola is simply today known as Vino. And three terms I always like to discuss quickly because I think it can help us um, when we learn to decipher a label of Italian wine are terms like Classico, 
if you see Classico on a label, Valpolicella Classico, Chianti Classico, Suave Classico, this is telling you that this was the original heartland of that particular region. Um, and typically that's the region that's known for the best quality wine. It's a smaller area so that you know that your grapes are coming from a more typically more homogenous terroir than kind of the larger overarching region. Like, you know, Suave Classico versus Suave. Valpolicella Classico versus the larger Valpolicella. Chianti Classico versus, versus the larger Chianti. Reserva is an indication of longer aging, longer than the required minimum of that region. So each DOC or DOCG in Italy has its own laws surrounding how long you have to age the wines or the particular grape varieties, right? Each region has laws regarding which grape variety you can use in order to call your wine Brunello, Brunello di Montalcino. And Reserva is indicates longer aging. So you can always, do you have to know how long it is? I always kind of say no. Um, if you're studying for wine exams, you do. But if you're a consumer just looking to understand the style of wine in the bottle, what you should understand is that Reserva wine will always have more of those age characteristics, right? So we think about, again, more of that leather, cigar box, sometimes mushroom and forest floor, dried leaf. They will have less fruit. Italian wines are not known for their fruitiness typically, right? They're known for their earthiness. And this has a lot to do with the fact that as they age, that fresh fruit gets stripped away. A lot of them are aged in barrel, so they oxidize slightly over time. So Reserva will always be slightly more oxidative, slightly more dried fruit, more earth and leather um, and dried flowers than really fresh ripe fruit. And Superiore is typically an indication of a higher level of alcohol, which will probably indicate that it was a riper year for the grapes in that area. Some DOCs or DOCG work Superiore into the name of the DOC or DOCG. So you see this for um, Dolcetto, especially within Piedmont. In Tuscany, we talk about some of these grape varieties, right? Treviano, the most planted white. In Tuscany, the only um, DOCG that we see for white wines uh, is Vernaccia di San Gimignano. We have other DOCs for whites on the coast, but we don't have any DOCGs, especially in the Tuscan heartland, um, in the kind of interior of the region. You might notice there is not, we talked earlier, right? In Chianti, you had to add white grapes. Now you don't, right? In Chianti Classico, you can't add white grapes anymore. Well, there's no Chianti Bianco. <laughs> you can't, there's no area or way to use these other grapes. So there's a couple of reasons that they might have codified into law at that time using your white grapes in a red wine. One of those is to actually increase acidity. Another of those is to increase wine. You have higher yield typically for white grape varieties. You can add that to your red wine and make it stretch a little bit, right? I mean, it could have just been that producers needed somewhere to put these wines. Vermentino, you see this planted primarily on the coast, Val di Cornia, Colli di Luni, you see it for whites in Bulgari as well. Vernaccia, as we mentioned, Vernaccia means like vernacular in Latin. Uh, essentially, it means native. So Vernaccia is a, is a term that you see not only limited to this white grape in San Gimignano, um, but primarily we think of it as associated with this region. You also see Malvasia, Grichetto, and Sauvignon Blanc, especially blended with Fermentino. It's quite common on the coast as well. You see it in Bulgari and places like that. Sangiovese, I mean, this is red wine country. Sangiovese is your main grape of Chianti and Chianti Classico, minimum 75% Sangiovese to call your wine Chianti, and minimum 85% to call it Chianti Classico. Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, I think that's also a minimum 75%. Brunello di Montalcino and Rosso di Montalcino. These require 100% Sangiovese. You cannot blend in anything else and call your wine by either of these names. Um, in Chianti, Chianti Classico, um, Vino Nobile di Montalcino, you might see the wine blended with Canaiolo, which is also native, soften some of the really austere attack of the Sangiovese grape. You might see Colorino, 
and the name suggests it's used oftentimes to add color. You can, in Chianti or Chianti Classico, use international grape varieties. So you might see some Cabernet Sauvignon or Merlot blended with these wines. You might see these IGT or Super Tuscans made entirely from these international or Bordelais grape varieties as well. So like Chianti, Chianti Classico, they can be 100% Sangiovese. Just because 75%, 85% is the minimum doesn't mean that producers do not make those in 100% um, percent Sangiovese styles. In Piedmont, Timorasso, a favorite white grape of ours, have a lot of dry extract, which means it tends to be uh, have an intensity and almost a tannin to the palate. Dry extract, like if you've ever maybe stayed up too late at the table talking with friends and you went to bed and you left your empty wine glasses on the table, but you came back the next morning to clean them and you see this like dried kind of film in the bottom of the glass. It doesn't always happen, but it does sometimes. Those are grapes that have a lot of this kind of dry extract. So a lot of this feeling that you tend to get on the palate. It comes in Timorasso, it's a thick skin grape. It has a ton of aging potential. It ages a little bit like something like Chenin Blanc or Riesling in terms of uh, some of the aroma characteristics that it does develop. It was nearly extinct, but it's really coming back um, around the town of Tortona. Muscat, you see, of course, and we should have called it Moscato, right? From Moscato di Asti. We'll talk about that in a moment. Cortese, the, the grape of Gave, minimum 95%, I believe, in order to call it Gave, 95% Cortese grape. This is your kind of most classic white of uh, Piedmont. It's dry, it's crisp, it's mineral, it's medium to light bodied, it's high in acidity. Arnais is considered to be one of the the better quality grapes though. Um, also nearly extinct until the 1960s when uh, wineries like Vietti um, and, um, uh, sorry, I don't know why I'm like Giacosa, when Vietti and Giacosa brought this back, like suddenly I'm just forgetting all of these Italian names. Um, they really brought the grape back from extinction. But it's also quite common in Piedmont that you'll see uh, wines lab labeled as overarching Piedmont DOC, which allowed something like 40 different grape varieties, or even the Longue DOC, which encompasses the area of Barolo and Barbaresco. You see them making varietal Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, varietal Riesling. Um, these can be really, really fascinating coming from the area. Not all producers love the indigenous white grapes of Piedmont. And so some of them do resort, even though they might be a staunchly traditional Barolo or Barbaresco producers, they might make a white wine from one of these international grape varieties. Nebbiolo is the most important for the red grape. It is not the most planted. It is difficult to grow, although as we've discussed, it's becoming easier. Um, it is powerful, it is tannic, it is tart, it develops flavors and aromas of dried herbs, Italian herbs, right? We say like basil and mint. It has a lot of floral rose characteristic to it. Oftentimes Nebbiolo is like, like potpourri, like you kind of like the potpourri that you're like putting on your, your stovetop or your radiator right now during the holiday season, right? You have this like dried orange peel, you have these spices, you have this bark to it, you have these rose petals. Uh, Dolcetto, this is the wine they commonly drink in the area. It means little sweet one. It's fruity and drinkable, but Dolcetto tends to have low, lower acidity and higher tannin. So it's a much more structured wine in terms of its tannic character. Barbera is the most planted red grape. It is can be a little bit rustic. It has high acid and low tannin. So it's the opposite of Dolcetto, a much easier drinking style. And then in Alto Piedmonte, so the more northern area of Piedmont, where you have regions like uh, Geme and Gatinara and Carema, you see Nebbiolo in the area blended with grapes like Bonarda and Vespolina. And Alto Piedmonte is uh, one of my favorite areas to really look for uh, quality but inexpensive and aged Nebbiolo. Um, the same the same restaurant that I was talking about that's nearby me, the, the Tuscan restaurant, they don't only have Tuscan wine, but it's Tuscan food. 
Um, and I went there and I ordered a bottle of it was the, the co-op in in uh, Gatanara. Um, and it was like 2012, I think. So they had a Barolo on the list, but it was like $120. I can't remember the producer. And it was like 2016. Or they had for $70, <laughs> this Gatanara wine, which is also Nebbiolo from 2012. And like, we know that Nebbiolo tend to be more fragrant and aromatic and softer on the palate as it ages, right? So we order the Gatanara and the, the waiter brings it over to us. And he said, ah, Gatanara wine for intelligent people. And it's one of those kind of tricks in the wine trade, or if you just know a little bit about it, you realize the quality that you can get when you understand some of these other regions. So don't forget Geme or Gatanara or Karema, right? Three areas in Alto Piemonte that produce Nebbiolo. It tends to be on slightly on the younger drinking side in the context of Nebbiolo and Piedmont right, by comparison to Barolo and Barbaresco, um, and it tends to oftentimes be much less expensive. It is further north um, with sandier soils, so that cooler climate and lighter soil do craft that sort of uh, easier drinking, younger, ready, younger style as well. So we created seven subzones um, in 1932. Classico was elevated to its own DOCG in 1984. Montes Bertoli was added in 1997. Um, there are several communes within Chianti Classico, which is where they uh, just sort of delimited or identified the 11 MGAs as of 2021 as well. Rufina, the highest elevation. Rufina is a great area, Chianti Rufina, to look for in really hot years. Or if you like a more acidic, kind of fresher style of the Sangiovese grape as well. Uh, most Chianti is uh, released March 1st of the year following the harvest. For Chianti Classico, it has to be released no sooner than October 1st of the year following the harvest. Reserva, two years of aging. Superiore, a little bit more alcohol. You also have Chianti uh, Classico Gran Silizione, which is a wine aged for a minimum of 30 months with uh, two, I believe also with two years in wood, uh, another half or full percentage of higher alcohol. And the MGA is approved for the Gran Silizione. I should have mentioned that before. Noteworthy wine, we talked about Brunello di Montalcino already, 100% Sangiovese your most powerful expression of Sangiovese because of this isolated clone, Sangio Sangiovese Grosso, which was isolated by Clemente Biondi Santi in 1865. And this had the longest minimum required aging, Brunello di Montalcino, of any wine in Italy. So a minimum of five years, Reserva can only be re released after six years after the harvest. It's aged for a minimum of two years in wood and four months in the bottle. Now that doesn't add up to five years, of course, but what this does is it really allows some flexibility for the winemaker um, for the, to craft the style of wine that they want to make, to reflect the personality of the winemaker. Uh, Rosso di Montalcino, you might be drinking this, more, uh, more economically friendly for the, for the consumer, released earlier, oftentimes from younger vines, but from the same grape and same area as Brunello di Montalcino. As you can see, most producers will make both. So this is La Fortuna. We have the Rosso and the Brunello here. Vino Nobile, if you love Chianti, um, this is a great region to seek out. There are not a ton of producers, um, especially that are exported in this region, Vino Nobile di Montalciano. Montepulciano d'Abruzzo is a DOC for the Abruzzo grape, or for, so for the Montepulciano grape from the Abruzzo region, right? Vino Nobile de Montepulciano, which we see here, is for Sangiovese. So minimum 70% here. I think I said 75 earlier. Reserva has to be aged a minimum of three years. It tends to be slightly further south. So it's a little softer than Sangiovese that we get coming from Chianti. Super Tuscan, the first was Sassacaya, the second was Tignanello. Uh, Bulgari is an area on the coast really known for these Super Tuscan styles. Tignanello comes from Chianti Classico, that's where the, the winery itself is located. 
and then Vinsanto. So your very traditional dessert or holy wine, um, usually made from dried Malvasia and Treviano grapes blended together and aged in chestnut or oak for three to eight years. Um, they don't top off the barrels in Vinsanto. So it gets this really oxidized style to it. Um, it's very um, uh, kind of like dried stone fruit and tangerines, and you get this uh, toffee characteristic to it. The interesting thing about Vinsanto is, although it is a dessert wine, it's oftentimes not as sweet as other dessert wines styled within the world, right? So we think about a, a Sautern or a Tokai. Vinsanto is usually not quite as sweet, a little bit more savory on the palate, kind of like, you know, dried nuts and straw characteristic to it. Um, so Barolo versus Barbaresco. And I told you I was going to go over. I apologize. We don't, we only have a few slides left. So if you do need to jump off, please do. And the great thing is, even though we have a few slides left, usually I get ahead of myself and give you information prior to actually coming to the slide. So we can kind of skim over some of these. So we know that um, Barolo is Piedmont's most prestigious DOCG, 100% Nebbiolo. We grow other grapes in, in Barolo. We just can't call them Barolo itself. So Dolcetto, Freja, Pelaverga, and Barbera will be declassified, usually as varietal Longue, right? Longue Barbera could be declassified as Barbera di Alba or something like that as well. Barolo can be produced in 11 communes, but the top five, Lamora and Barolo, your softer styles, Castiglione Filetto, Monforte di Alba, the one that I forgot, and Saralunga di Alba on the eastern side, your more structured styles. Um, 38 months minimum requirement for aging Barolo, um, 18 months in wood. So they recently changed this. Uh, it used to be two years in oak. There was a proposal to change the oak aging regime of uh, Barolo to one year and they kind of met a halfway point, right? They met in the middle at 18 months. So Reserva Barolo has to be aged for 62 months, but it still only requires 18 months in wood. So kind of like we talked about for the Brunello, this gives the producer um, more room to play and to craft the style that they think really suits their mission, right? We know about the traditionalist versus the modernist. Um, the real modern, or real traditionalists were Giacomo Conterno, Giuseppe Mascarello, Bruno Giacosa. Um, Bruno Giacosa is the other producer who also, uh, as mentioned before, was instrumental in bringing uh, our nace back as well, that white grape that we see planted here. These are your traditionalists, uh, Lorenzo Acamasso as well, another important one. I mean, there's a lot of really important produ um, producers, Brezza, Brezza, another really important traditional producer. And the modernists are usually classified as Paolo Scavino, Angela Gaia, who is more known for his Barbaresco or his um, declassified wine um, because he was making wine in Barbaresco, but he still wanted to add 5% Barbera as his family had done for years. And when the law was set at 100%, he decided to declassify their wine. Today, Gaia is actually making since um, like 16 or 18 or something like that. Gaia actually labels his wines as Barbaresco again. Because of global warming, they say that they no longer need to add the Barbera to the wine to soften the Nebbiolo in Barbaresco. So he's back to using the Barbaresco appellation on his wines again, Elio Altare, also one of the modernists, we're beginning to see a lot of the famous Sori or single vineyard sites uh, represented on the labels. Le Roquet, Brunate, Mon Privato, Busia, Canubi, Barolo, we're just, excuse me, Barbaresco, we're just to the northeast of Barolo, um, located along the Tanaro River, also 100% Nebbiolo, but it's usually considered to be more perfumed, more elegant and softer in terms of its body. This is due to the more northern location, but also due to uh, the slightly cooler, uh, the northern location and cooler climate, but also slightly more uh, sandy, tortonian, calcareous marl as well. So the main soil type that we see, much like the western commune of Barolo as well. 
So 26 months aging, also a lower required minimum than what we see in Barolo. Reserva requires 50 months. Both require nine months aging in wood. Many producers go far beyond that. Of course, many producers also go far beyond just the minimum aging requirement in general. We also see the modern producers like Gaia that we talked about and more traditional like Giacosa. Again, many producers today are somewhere in the middle. Um, many, many producers will age partially in kind of smaller barrique or maybe a little bit of new oak and then partially in the large old boti, the really large neutral Slovenian oak, and then blend it together, right? So one of the reasons that Nebbiolo is also more accessible today is because of the slightly warmer climate that we are seeing. Moscata di Asti, I love Moscato. I know a lot of wine people give it a really bad rap. Vietti makes an absolutely fantastic style, the Marchese di Grezzi. It's the holiday season. I like to drink as I'm preparing food. I usually have to start preparing dinner for holidays at like 10 o'clock in the morning. And Moscato di Asti is perfect because it's around 5% alcohol. It has a little sweetness to it. So I can have it with my, with my breakfast. I can swap it in and out with coffee and I'm not going to be wasted. I'm going to be able to drink my wine and still take care of my responsibilities for dinner, right? So I love Moscato, Moscato di Asti. Moscato di Asti is more artisanal. It's a smaller production and it's slightly sparkling it's frizzante as opposed to asti which is a spumante or totally sparkling wine asti has a, a much larger and more commercial um, more mechanized production so moscato di asti is usually the higher quality style gavi we talked about the really dry crisp fresh mineral high acid cortese grape our nace lower in acidity richer in body a little bit more on the kind of floral and slightly nutty side. We say there's a lot of kind of smoky and like dried almond characteristic to it. If you like Syrah, you'd probably like Rouquet coming from this region and coming from Rouquet di Castagnole, Monferrato. Really small production, but some fun wines here. Um, I'm just talking so much. I feel like I haven't taken a breath. There's a lot to go over and we could have gone on for like four more hours about this, but we'll finish off on some food, right? In Tuscany, the foods are very humble. A lot of people like to say oftentimes, um, we mentioned the white beans. We see fish soup on the coast. You have that with Fermentino or Sauvignon Blanc, the Bistecca alla Fiorentina, which is the beef steaks from the local cattle. There's a lot of game meat. Um, we see a lot of uh, like chicken liver mousse is incredibly co common in the area. Porcini mushroom, uh, pecorino, Toscano, all white, all washed down, of course, with the uh, the unsalted bread. Biscotti is the traditional cookie that you would serve with the Vinsanto as well. Biscotti, just like Vinsanto, is not about um, a really kind of tooth aching sweetness, right? There's more savory elements, both biscotti and Vinsanto. In Piedmont, we see Bagna Cauda, which is a kind of a blended anchovy and herb dip that's usually served with fresh crudite or vegetables. Agnolotti, the little uh, ravioli, of course, risotto, incredibly important. Mushroom risotto, truffle risotto, Barolo. You know what, it's 2021, do yourself a favor, get some truffles for the holidays this year. <laughs> you know, you can't do it very often. You might not be able to do it every year. Truffles are incredibly expensive, but there just really is nothing like the experience of having truffles. If you're in New York City, there are restaurants, um, the Modern, the Nomad, that serve truffles at cost. So, I mean, you're still paying, you know, like $30, $40 for a, a gram of truffles shaved over your dish. But um, it's a really kind of great way if you do want to try truffle to do so. Uh, Gianduia is a hazelnut and chocolate spread. Uh, Nutella comes from Piedmont. This is one of the most probably important things that you might learn. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but something else that I learned in this the podcast that I listened to today is that Nutella really was able to keep a lot of people in the Piedmont region, because one of the things that they championed was they 
had part-time workers and they also created a free like either a bus fare or they had a bus that picked up their employees to bring them to the the plant to work and then take them home and this allowed these these people to work both jobs so many of them had their own their vines or their own crops or made wine on the side. So it allowed them to still go home later in the day and be able to take care of the vines and make wine. Hazelnut truffles, hazelnut cake, uh, brasato di Barolo, it's kind of like a beef stew and roasted peppers with anchovies. I hope you go and taste all of these things. Um, I'm sorry to keep you guys over tonight. I'd like to know, are you team Piedmont or are you team Tuscany? Or are we opening both and we're calling it a draw? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Everybody's so quiet. Um, I feel like I talked really, really fast doing that, but we had a lot to cover. Um, I'd always, of course, love to hear any questions that you have, any feedback. Um, I'll reach out tomorrow with a copy of the recording in case you need to go back over everything that was said today. Um, I hope you are inspired to have some really fantastic food this evening with some great wine, or maybe tomorrow we're moving into the weekend. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great night. Enjoy. It's nice to see everybody. I really appreciate all of you. Bye.